Welcome to the First Nation Speaker Series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging country. Tonight we're on Gadigal land. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The First Nation Speaker Series is a program in partnership with GML Heritage, the Deep Research Centre at the Australian National University and Sydney Living Museums. Tonight we are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Leah Louis-Chiviche, and I apologise if I butchered the name, <laughs> talking on science, mourning and loss, W.J. McClay and Erob in 1875. At the end of the talk, there will be time for questions, and if you're watching online, just pop the questions into the chat. Please welcome Leah. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, everyone um, who could be here tonight and those who are joining us online. I would also like to pay my respect to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So, um, my talk tonight captures something about um, my thinking about the cultural responsibility in relation to the return to their place of origin, uh, an ancestor, a mummified adult man, and the skulls of 12 others taken in 1875 by William John McClay from an island where my parents grew up, and that's the photograph, that's the island in the, in the first slide. Um, for almost 150 years, they have been kept at the University of Sydney, so 1875. So holding this event at Elizabeth Bay House is significant. Um, what an incredible place this is. And it's significant because this is where W.J. Maclay, who was the nephew of Alexander Maclay, he was living here at the time that he went on this voyage and made this collecting. Um, he'd been living here since 1865 as a tenant of his cousin, an absentee landlord, George Maclay, who was, the, who was one of the sons of Alexander and the inheritor of Maclay's extensive uh, natural history collection and properties after, and George after his brother William Sharp had passed away in 1865. So from 1865, William John Maclay lived here until his death in 1891. Uh, the estate was considerably bigger than it is now. Um, and it comes from, Alexander Maclay was given, um, was presented with 54 acres of Elizabeth Bay, pretty much all of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bay, I think. Um, yes, I'm seeing a nod there. Um, so, so, so what stands the footprint of this house today is tiny, yeah, by comparison to what uh, Alexander Maclay was first um, uh, awarded in the 1820s, in the late 1820s. Um, so on this land then, after Maclay, uh, John William Maclay, the nephew, made all his collecting, he was able to um, purchase from his cousin George more land, a little bit more land, and he built places to store his collection, his collecting, including, so in, that included ethnological material that he collected and also the natural history material that he'd inherited. Um, and this was so until 1888, when his collections became a bequest to the University of Sydney and formed the founding collection for the Maclay Museum. Um, you may also no know that that Maclay Museum collection was subsumed by the Chow Chak Wing Museum at the University of Sydney, which opened in 2020. Um, so I've spent a bit of time walking around this area. Um, there are the, some of the amazing buildings that exist today have their, have a strong historical association with the Maclays and even the place name. So you might have come, you might have seen Onslow Place, which is just near here, um, was a relative and featured in this, uh, and one of the Onslows featured in this ex uh, expedition as well. But let's leave Elizabeth Bay House for now in, in one sense and I want to talk about um, William John Maclay and his 1875 uh, expedition. Right. Using this. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So the 1875 expedition, um, known generally as the Shevard Expedition and, known, and named for the ship that Maclay had purchased and fitted out, um, 
was the first, so this expedition was the first Australian scientific expedition into New Guinea. Its explicit aim was to collect and document the natural environment. And the expedition members collected, collected vast amounts of both animal and plant material from the east coast of Australia, so they collected their way up the coast um, from the Torres Strait and also from coastal New Guinea. The material and the data from the ex expedition, along with important Torres Strait cultural material, as I said, were a substantial collection in the Maclay Museum's holdings at the University of Sydney. And as I said, Maclay also collected in this time um, off Darnley Island in the space of 14 days he collected um, the mummified body of a man and um, some other remains, the, the skulls of 12 others. So I'll begin, I'll move on and orient you to place a bit. So this shows you where I'm talking about. On the northern edge, the, north, um, the northeast edge of the Torres Strait, very close to the end of the, where the Great Barrier Reef ends, um, and Erub is a volcanic island, yeah, along with Murray Islands, the Murray Islands, which is a little bit, a little bit to the, um, a little bit to the southeast. So the area of Erub is about 570 hectares, and I've got this other map here to orient you a little bit better. Um, and it's at its highest point, it's about 181 metres above sea level. Fertile soil and freshwater springs supported productive gardens, and each family or clan cultivated yam, banana, sweet potato as staples, and coconut grew abundantly. So this is what Maclay came on to yeah, when he ended up on, on Erub. Garden foods were supplemented by fishing <clears throat> and hunting, and harvest, and harvest from the fish traps, or size, which stretched, which stretched along the northeastern shoreline. <coughs> Erubamle, so the people of Erub, Erubamle of the past and present know Erub through communal property rights of the four primary clan groups, um, the Peidu, the Saisarem, the Samsep and the Murem. And these clan groups have rights and responsibilities uh, for specific tracts of land, for living on and for gardening and for areas of the sea. In the intertidal zones, ownership is also extended uh, to the Sai, or which is the fish traps, um, and adjacent to the clan lands, as ownership rights extend beyond the shoreline and also include outlying reefs and caves. Yeah. So in this kind of area, this vast area of ocean, so sea, coral sea, 48,000 square kilometres is the area of the Torres Strait. 92% is open ocean. Yeah. So, but we're talking about people living on 17 islands of 100 islands. So the sea, like the land, is known and it's named. And the retelling of stories affirm both knowledge and narrate the cultural connection and responsibility to land and seascapes. So Maclay arrives on Arub in 1875 to a place that I've just described, yeah. um, a place where people, um, where people know their belonging to place. Yeah. And I think that's a really important kind of aspect of this. So the Shevet leaves Sydney though, let's go back, come back to Sydney. The Shevet left Sydney on the 18th of May in 1875 and there was a lot of fanfare. The press were out, they were lauding um, both this as a scientific pursuit but there was also um, the hope that Maclay would find something out about New Guinea to make New Guinea a place that could be, could be colonised by, by Australia. Yeah, as well. So that is also part of this. He doesn't do that very well and he gets, um, he gets slammed about it by the press when he returns, but that's a whole other story. So the total crew on the Shevet was about 30 men. 19 crewmen included six Rotuman Islanders, all aged in their 20s, an American medical doctor and the first mate, Robert Williams, who kept the ship's log. 
The engineer on the voyage, uh, Lawrence Hargraves, also kept a diary of the journey. Um, and in his diary, he's, he, he, um, he doesn't like Maclay and he, and he writes about it um, in, in a no-nonsense kind of, no way. The 19, uh, the 19 member scientific crew included Maclay's expedition leader and voyage entomologist, his curator, George Masters, his cousin, Arthur Onslow. So Onslow Place is just out here. Um, an Onslow, who had been on the Herald, um, a survey, a hydrological survey ship um, vessel in, in, uh, during 1857 to 61, and he had been through the Torres Strait. The other important person on this voyage was Charles Edwards. And now Edwards had, um, Edwards had, been, had also been in the Torres Strait uh, um, harvesting sea cucumber. Yeah? So Edwards knew something about the Torres Strait, and he knew a lot about Erub. Yeah? So perhaps it's no accident that Erub is where they go. Um, the remaining men on the crew were variously skilled in taxidermy and zoological and botanical collecting. There were numerous collecting sites along coastal Queensland between Cape York uh, and between Cape York and New Guinea. Collections in the Torres Strait began near Somerset which was where um, the, the Queensland administration first established before moving on to, to Thursday Island. Um, so it began near Somerset before moving into the Central Islands. So, so, so a few of the Central Islands, Sue, Bet, uh, Pol, I think, Warabara. Um, let me see. Throughout the voyage, the dredge everywhere, take everything approach of Maclay, along with the toil of his army of professional and amateur collectors, and here both Indigenous and Pacific Islander collectors, generated a remarkable body of material. I'm kind of moving here between island, place, and, and Maclay on his moving science lab. Oh, now why did that happen there? I didn't want to go there first. Okay. No, I do. Okay, this is what I should have showed you before. So um, we think this photograph was taken by Onslow. It's in the State Library collection. Um, Onslow was on this, on this voyage. And there are other photos that I will talk about later, which has, which has brought the natural history and the cultural material together with the ancestral material. And, um, and the photographs of Onslow have been really important for me uh, in making that connection. Okay, so the Erub, the Erub that um, the Maclay lands on. He's there in the time of the Sagar. And the Sagar is when the southeast trade winds blow and if I go back to this map here, um, is there a pointy thing here? I can't really use it on there. Um, but you'll s maybe you won't see because this is quite small. But the Sagar is to um, you can see some a squiggly a squiggly white line down the bottom right hand side of the screen. Yeah. So that is the marker for the wind direction of the Sagar, the southeast trade winds, and the other main wind is the Koki, which is in that top other corner, yeah, up here. Um, and when I talked to my uncle recently, he said he remembers, so he grew up there, he was born in what, 1944, and he remembers growing up there and he said, he said you couldn't really walk anywhere you wanted because it was people's land, yeah. But so he said, so we, um, and my, my father's family, um, their place is um, the, down the, so weird to talk about this. So it's on the kind of the left-hand side, on the western side of the island, so the southwestern side of the island, um, which is on the cocky side, yeah? So my uncle says that mostly you just stuck to your side. So if you lived on the Sagara side, you would venture into the area that was part on that Sagara side. But if you lived on the cocky side, then that's what you did, yeah? So we get this kind of, um, kind of the major kind of seasonal times. So Erublet knowing of time is premised on observing and learning from nature. The seasons of Nagir, Koki, and Sagir are the foundational measures of temporality. 
the cyclic rhythm actuated and organised organised islanders' relations with the environment. Wind direction and force, the breeding cycles of animals, the migration patterns of birds and the flowering and fruiting of plant foods signalled the right timing for practices as well as the passing of time. Whilst there is some variation in the region's climatic conditions, Nigeria is a time of calm seas when marine turtles return to breed and nest. Koki is a rainy season, the time of the northwest, northwest monsoon when particular garden foods were harvested, others planted and fish were plentiful. Let me go back to that slide. Sagar brings strong southeasterly winds and rough seas. It was the time to travel for trade and ceremonies. The winds of Sagar always brought visitors to Erub. Yeah. So it was surely no surprise to Erubamler when the Shevet dropped anchor on the leeward side of Erub. So that happens on the 31st of July. Yeah. 31st of July, yeah, 31st of July, 1875. And they are there until, and they leave on the 13th of August. So what do they take? What, do they, what are they able to amass in this time? Heaps, heaps of stuff. So I'm yet to cross-reference this kind of uh, this, approx this table of approximation of specimens with the actual collection, but the number of mollusks, especially mollusks, <laughs> you've got like so when that says that says 759 lots, which means really the boxes. Yeah, you can see that big photograph there with the boxes in them. So that's the original collecting boxes. Yeah, so it's kind of still there as it was taken in 1875. Um, so a lot is just one of those boxes. So 75, what, what, 759 of those boxes. And there might be two or three shells in there. There might be hundreds, yeah, because he collected, yeah, he, yeah, he was very, um, I want to say anal retentive, but he was obsessed, yeah, he was obsessed, yeah, he, his collecting was obsessive. Um, in his report to the Linnaean Society of New South Wales in 1875, and kind of just on that of his kind of um, seeing himself as a scientist, he establishes the Linnaean Society branch in Sydney in the year before, in, in 1874. But anyway, writing in the Linnaean Society um, report, um, he, wrote, uh, he wrote that the marine mollusk collection was, was, I quote, so large that I cannot even guess at the number and the value of the specimens, and that no way was the yield so good as at Darnley. And really, uh, there are so many um, photographs I have of this collection. It would, yeah, it's, um, I think I've written about it as a curator's dream, like a natural history curator's dream, because that stuff that's taken in just a two week period is this kind of amazing snapshot of the kind of the, the, the biodiversity, yeah, of, the, of, of just one island. So we also collected um, cultural material, a variety of cultural material. And for me, what's interesting in, in these images, and maybe only a hundred or so items. <clears throat> so what's interesting for me in this, um, what kind of really piqued my interest initially was the, the layer op mask, this, that turtle shell mask there, that human, the face mask, as you can see there, uh, in my work, from my work um, with turtle shell and turtle shell masks. But the other thing that's in there uh, is um, next to it, lying down, is the fringe, is, is a, is a kind of a fringe that um, made from natural fibres and worn on arms or on legs and put together and worn around the waist of skirts, yeah, by both women and men. Um, so as I said, while the natural history and the cultural material are rich beyond a curator's dream, for me it was the, these two things tied to the ancestral material that was collected, the ancestor that was collected. Um, and that's what's taken up <clears throat> excuse me, both my time, um, my thinking time, but also my worrying time, you know, when you have those things that you wonder and worry about, because I thought, I'm not going to, these old people, you are here, I acknowledge that you are here, and I'm going to look at this stuff, but um, they, <sighs> somehow they reappear in, in my path 
which has meant I've had to look at everything and not just acknowledge them and, and say, you guys can stay there. So that's, the, so that's been one of the things that um, has kept me um, thinking about what, how to put this exhibition together. And, and I started working on it in 2018. Um, in 2019, I did a trip to the Torres Strait. And then we all know what happened in 2020 and 2021. So things, it kind of went into a hiatus. Um, uh, and then I did, I've just come back from a trip there. Like I was there, was it last week? Anyway, I was there very recently in the last one or two weeks. Um, but I wasn't able to find the people to talk to about the old people. But I found, I was able to talk to rangers about the natural history material. And I was able to talk to um, some artists, some islander artists about the cultural material. So it's kind of coming, which, which, which has me thinking, it's kind of coming together in, a, in its own way. Yeah? Um, these, yeah, finding the people or the people putting themselves in my path. Uh, and really because of incidents that I kind of created. But anyway, uh, some other long stories. Um, so what we get then is um, what Maclay records in his journal, yeah? So he keeps this journal and throughout the voyage he notes different things, yeah? Um, and it's almost kind of incidental in the way that he notes things. There is no, um, there isn't a strong narrative, it's just, you know, very descriptive. We were here, we did this, it was this time of the day, it was, it was this day of the month. So here are a couple of things, comments that he makes about his collecting. Um, <clears throat> so Monday, uh, the 2nd of August, they have only been there. That was, yeah, they arrived on the 31st of July. Most of the people of the ship were ashore all day in one direction or another. I went ashore with Brazier to search the shore at low water. He got a good many shells, etc. cetera. In, and in the evening, I purchased from natives a large snake and a mummied human head. So it's, and even for the, you know, the one below, it's, all, it's incidental in the way that it's recorded as a kind of a by the way. Um, so at the end of the week, Friday, August 5th, I have succeeded in getting several mummied heads and the first mate, that's Robert Williams, has gone around in the boat to the village today to get me a complete mummy which has been promised him. So I started to think about what makes the collecting of ancestors, the collecting of ancestral material possible? What conditions need to be in place for that to be possible? Yeah. So um, if you know about the way um, uh, rac um, racial science developed, you know, the taking of the skulls of indigenous peoples but, and, and, and people who were criminals and people, you know, so, so people who were seen as um, marginal to civilised society was part of the way science sought to promote its scienciness, yeah, its, sci its science-ness. Um, and of course from, you know, the Australian, on the Australian mainland, um, Trugunini um, from Tasmania, Pemaway. Um, so, in some ways, I guess I should not be surprised that this is the kind of stuff that's happening. Yeah, but Maclay is a, like he's into insects. Yeah, he's a he's so there is this kind of there's this kind of strange thing as well about well why does he what is it that happens that he does this that he you know is it just because he's there and it's offered yeah is it that kind of opportunistic so that's the kind of the Maclay I've been trying to understand Maclay to talk to people in the Torres Strait about who this man is because they want people want to know well why would he do that like why was he here and how well, how was it possible for him to do that and the other question that I kind of have also put to people is um, why was he allowed to like why was he was he allowed to did people know he was and it's like they don't know the answers to that you know that was it was taken 150 years ago but it's also or nearly 150 years ago but it's also about for me trying to think into what makes certain things possible um, and then I saw these other photos from taken by Onslow well they were part of the same collection has anyone seen these photos before? By the way, all right. 
So they are available in, um, the, Mitchell, in the Mitchell Library. So what do these photos say to me? So the group image for me is striking for its inclusion of at least three people whose heads are covered in a greyish mud. You may not see it so clearly kind of on this screen. So this is a practice associated with mourning. The other is of a lone woman, likely a widow. Her head and body covered in grey mud and she also wears long vegetable fibre fringes. Um, around her neck, um, and you can't really see them, but there are shorter fringes on her elbows and just below her right knee. In, re in, a related, in the related collection, these fringes are recorded as mourning dress. Yeah. Sorry, my notes are a little bit confused here. These are the earliest visual record um, that I've located on this Arubamle practice called Bud. For Eastern Islanders, in the period between the announcement of the death and the burial of a relative, family and friends will gather to sit with the closest relatives of the deceased to mourn their loss and show respect to the family. The image shows that during the two week stay on Erub, while the Shevet voyagers were frantically collecting whatever they could dredge or get their hands on, some of the Arubamle were in mourning. Um, in his journal, as I've shown, McClay records the purchase or collection of the human material, but he is silent on, must, on, what, on what must have been for Arubamle a time of deep sadness and mourning. So why? What's happened? As the Shevet departed Sydney in May 1875, a measles outbreak was taking hold across coastal New Guinea and eastern Torres Strait. Um, there's some idea that Charles Edwards writes in his narrative of the voyage that um, measles is introduced from Murray Island, yeah? but it comes to Murray Island somehow. Okay, so in September 1875, um, sorry, a September 1875 letter to the London Missionary Society Foreign Secretary from the Port Moresby-based missionary W.G. Laws paints a picture of the devastation. In his letter, too, he acknowledges the role the LMS played in the spread of the disease. Laws writes, our anxiety and trouble have been greatly increased by an epidemic brought by the Ellen Gowan. The Ellen Gowan was the LMS steamship and uh, continuing laws continues, and which proves to be measles. I expressed my fear that the natives would get it. Samuel McFarlane said, quote, they most likely would, but they must take their chance of that, unquote. Laws writes, they have taken their chance, and for the last two months, measles has been epidemic. How far it will spread and where it will die out is impossible to say. It is very sad in my mind that our own vessel should have been the cause of so much sorrow and suffering. In the so in the time that Maclay is on um, Erub, Samuel McFarlane and his wife reappear as well. So they arrive there like towards the end of towards the end of that two week. A lot happens. Oh my God! Like a lot can happen in two weeks. So so they turn up there as well, um, and it's. And I think the, the relationship between Maclay and McFarlane is quite cold. Yeah? Maclay is told that McFarlane has brought some things for him, but he hasn't. Yeah? And in fact, he ignores McClay. They, they ignore each other. Yeah? Maclay goes off in a huff and ignores McFarlane. So McFarlane is one of the first two missionaries to land in, a, in the Torres Strait in 1871 and in, to introduce Christianity, the London Missionary Society. So he's a really significant character in a couple of ways. One, for his introduction of Christianity. But long after Maclay has left, by 1886, um, Samuel McFarlane is raiding a, um, a sacred house on Pulu, which is one of the, which is an island near Mabiog Island in the Western Torres Strait, where he takes, 
don't, so, and I, I can't, can't quite remember the number, but more than 30, 30 to 40 human skulls yeah, that the missionary, McFarlane, takes and he sells on yeah, as a way of supporting himself and his family. So there is this, um, and they are both, you know, see themselves as Christian men. Um, and for me, McFarlane is there to bring Christianity, yeah, to, to, um, to civilise islanders. So there is this, uh, it's problematic that this is also part of what he's doing. But, okay. So last year was the 100, on the 1st of July, was a 150-year celebration of the landing of the missionaries, yeah. So um, the arrival of missionaries is known in the Torres Strait as the coming of the light, yeah? bringing light into darkness, which is a fairly common Pacific thing. So in other parts of the Pacific where missionaries came, people talk about being in darkness before and now Christianity brought light. Very few islanders know that McFarlane spread, that, you know, that as McFarlane spread the light of Christianity by ferrying his cadre of Pacific Islander teachers around the region in 1875, he was also spreading measles. Um, on Erebus, it was believed that almost half the population of an estimated 140 people had died. Yeah. So 140 um, is a number that Charles Edwards gives. Um, so Maclay's collecting on Erub in that kind of 14 days, in that kind of July, August, must be considered in this context. In February 2019, I went to Erub to talk to, um, to talk to knowledge owners and elders about the collection and about all, about all of the collection. Yeah. I took photographs of uh, the cultural material. I took photographs of the natural history material. I took uh, copies of the pho these photographs and showed them and a number of other photographs as well. So as I passed around kind of a few albums of the material and discussed the images, um, I tried to answer all the questions I could, particularly around the ancestral remains. And I, it's important to say here that um, the University of Sydney's repat, repat program, repatriation program, has tried for, um, I, since at least the late eight, 1980s to return, the material, to, to return this material. So there has been a want by the, so the material's been deaccessioned um, and it's waiting to be returned. Um, but for many, many years, when those, in, when those inquiries have been made to Erub, there's been, silence has been the answer. Yeah. And um, sometimes silence is an, is an answer anyway. Yeah? So it's like thinking into, well, what does this silence mean? Yeah. And, you know, and people, people know vaguely where the material was taken from, where the ancestor was taken from, but no one knows who he belongs to. Yeah? So there is this other stuff that, that hangs, that hangs with this. Um, so when I talked with people in 2019 about, let me see if I can, I've got a final slide here. So there's one of the images of some of those old, uh, old men who came to that meeting. About 20 people turned up to this meeting, which I was, I was gob gobsmacked about. Um, so I talked about the measles epidemic of 1875, which little, they knew little about. And over several hours, our conversations were earnest, animated, and at times very sad. As the meeting started to wind up, I asked people to think about and to talk to each other about whether they wanted me to continue with this work. Yeah. So it would be quite easy to start to separate all of this out and just work on the return of the ancestral remains, which is what I think I started to do, but there is something that keeps pushing me to treat it all together, which is a road um, that I've decided to take. So I just wanted to make sure when I've talked to people on Erub that what they recognise that I work with all of the material together. Um, and in a, whatever exhibition results from this will include something about um, the ancestor that was taken in, um, in 1875. So I guess in closing, and I guess for now, because this is one of those, you know, one of those, could be a never ending story, who knows? It's already 150 years old, almost. Um, 
So as I consider Maclay's collecting in a broader context, in the broader context of what happened for Erubim, what was happening for Erubimlair, and bring the cultural materials together with the ancestral remains and the natural history materials, and the mourning that must have surely permeated the mood of Maclay's time on Erub. So I'm starting to elaborate a framework for the exhibition that includes all these things, everything that was collected in 1875. Um, so along with curating an exhibition on Erub cultural practices and ecological knowledges, which is where I thought I was starting, um, it's much bigger now. And I guess my biggest hope is that in working through the collection with Arubam Lair, we'll not only find um, uh, we'll not only find the final resting place for the old people, but I hope that it might inspire other Arubam Lair to engage with and write their own histories of this collection. Thank you. So I have one question from online, Leah. Okay. Um, you're researching pretty he heavy and deep content. What are some ways that you take care of yourself and I guess protect yourself and all with the content you're researching? Oh, wow, that's a very caring question. <laughs> Thank you, questioner. Um, I, I try to spend a lot of time on the beach, I guess, is the, yeah, is probably the easiest answer, or the, yeah, the most common thing I do. I live um, near Malabar, so I do lots of walks, and I know there is near, near the point, uh, what is it called? I think it's named for whoever, it's named for someone from Cook's, from the Endeavour. Um, that there is a, a burial place for um, the, re, the re, repat material that's gone back to La, La Peru's people. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I just spend a, try to spend a lot of time by the sea um, and, and, and kind of hang around the edges of um, conversations of old island people. I kind of, although a lot of younger people are saying I'm one of them now as well. So it's like, um, yeah, so I keep looking for, you know, when I say old people and my, my, yeah, my cousins are like, you mean like you? And I'm like, no, 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 no. No, I mean older than me, like people who know other things. Yeah. Yep. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Look, because I think, I think there's a number of things. Um, one is the way, uh, the way, certainly since the native title legislation um, came, came through in the early 90s, the way people think about traditional land, the, about their land. Yeah? So one of the key things is that um, What's needed is more knowledge about exactly where he was taken from, so he can be returned to the right place. Yeah. So, um, so there, part of it is around people's caretaking of their traditional land and knowing if there are things that should come back to here, then we are, we are um, willing to accept those things, but they must be things that are off here. Yeah. Beca and so there is... Um, there are, you know, it's very strong beliefs around um, the bad, uh, the bad spiritual effects, the bad spirit effects of putting in place thing, putting putting things in places where they don't belong. Yeah. So that is one of the one of the I think that is one of the primary reasons. Yeah. Um, uh, and and the other thing is also it's like, 
you know, when we say if there's 140 people there at the time and almost half have died, then who, 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 where is the story of that? Where are the stories of, the, of that taking? And I can't find any. I can't find anyone who knows those stories that were passed down. That's why I kind of hang around old people and listen to what they've got to say with the hope <coughs> that someone says something that I think, oh, that might mean this, and off I go in my bit kind of absent-minded um, detective mode. Um, and, the, and I guess... The, and so, there, so there is stuff about... Um, the potential malevolence that might come from things that don't belong there. But the other, and more recently, one of the, um, one of the younger old men um, has said that, you know, that, that doesn't matter. They should just come. And, we, and if, there is, if, there, if stuff happens, we'll just have to deal with it. And I just think, I don't know, I'm not, that, I'm not entirely comfortable with that as an option either, you know, because it's... it's People now have to deal with something that's not of their creation. Yeah. So that yeah. So there's. I think it's a. It's a multi. Um, yeah. There. Are, there are kind of multiple issues that, that complicate the return. Um, you know. And you know. It may turn out that people agree that he can stay where he is because he's looked after where he is. You know. I don't know because. But that's because that is also an option. The national resting place that um, has been talked about that's going to be built in Canberra is also another option. So for me, it's also about thinking up options to present people with. Yeah, if for his return there is not an option. Oh, there's one more question. That is a really hard question because I don't. Um, I, I, I've gone into this not knowing the shape it will take. Yeah, it's becoming shaped by what um, Erubam Lair uh, are happy for me to do, and and on some level are happy to ignore the things that I do that they might kind of just, you know, may, they may not like it, but they might kind of turn a blind eye to it. Yeah? And I won't know what those things are until I do them and I kind of, and then I'm told, oh, no. Yeah. So, um, so the wisdom, I don't know, tread lightly, um, but tread everywhere. It's like... And, and know that there may be times when you have, have to walk back on the decisions you make or the things that you do, and you might have to compensate for, you know, missteps, yeah? So it's, yeah, it's... Um, and, and I guess the other, the other thing is that I'm, I'm one person putting my spin on this. Yeah, as well. So it's not this, you know, it, I will involve a number of Eru people in the exhibition, but at the, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, you know, unless people um, really jump on board and say, no, we're going to we're gonna do this our way and you, we'll, you just do what we tell you, um, it's my exhibition. Yeah. So it's, but, but, you know, it kind of, it's, um, it's coming together as I kind of, move forward. Uh, but for the last few years, I've just been walking in circles, as most of us have. So hopefully, my circles will get bigger. And at some point, I will leave the walking around and find a path. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite organic, which is not ideal for, you know, exhibitions that say, no, we're, we're, putting, it, we're putting it up in these three weeks. It's there for three months, and then it's coming down. And I just keep pushing back, pushing back, pushing back. And I've now said it would be a good 150-year um, exhibition to, to do for the 150 years of this expedition. Um, 
and my next steps are next year to go back to Erub in the same period that um, in the same period that the Shevet was there in those 14 days and to work especially with kids um, in the primary school to work with them on that nat on the natural history stuff to do some kind of surveys of what's there now to do some stuff on what's happening with the sea what's what you know what can we tell about sea level rises what does it mean about what does how is climate change impacted so it's to to then to, to use it as a jumping off point for other things as well yep it might follow on from that but i was wondering can you tell us a little bit about the um, what you as an insider or at least a semi insider because of you know your parents and, and knowing um, your connections there and i was thinking also about the language that you can use you know which um, we couldn't <laughs> to you know, sort of communicate and how that's really helped yeah yep yep yeah it has helped it's um so there is not there is not a lot of Miriam Miriam Mirror spoke Mirror spoken on Erub, but people do speak Creole, and I do speak and know Creole. So I yeah. So I talk to people a lot in Creole. Um, getting them to read some of the stuff that I write is hard because yeah, and the older people are like, oh, can you read it to me? I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> it's a book. <laughs> it's okay. um, so it's. So yeah, so that is a that is a challenge, but but the and the biggest challenge of it is the time it takes, you know, because we're all and you know we're gonna you know get that paper in and you know you've got this amount of time to turn it around and it's like oh it's gonna take a bit longer, you know. I've got a, I've been writing a chapter about this since 2019 and for two years, like I said, I've just been walking in circles with it, thinking I don't know I can write about what I can't write about, but that's about it. Um, but yeah, certainly, uh, yeah, but it takes me a while to get into the rhythm of speaking Creole when I get there as well, because people are like, oh, you don't, you're not from around here, are you? It's that kind of, they don't say those, but you know, oh, yeah, okay, you, you speak Creole like you're from Sydney. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes. Question, because there's two epidemics, there's the measles and then there's COVID. Well, that's a good. Yeah, it's a good question because we haven't. I haven't found the right people to talk to. It's um, and it's. It drives me nutty because people don't tell you who you should talk to. They just tell you, "No, nah, I can't talk to you about that." I'm like, mm, "Who do I talk to?" <laughs> it's like, like, and and there's no answer. I'm like, okay, I just have to hang around old people and eavesdrop a bit. You know that kind of style of research. <laughs> Um, so I didn't. So in my last trip, I didn't get a chance to talk to um, to the, the people who I spoke to the last time. Last time weren't there. Some people have passed away. The older people have passed away. And then, even with our planning, I, we found out the the day before we arrived, um, fourteen dinghy loads of people left to go to one of the central islands for a tombstone ceremony. So the, I don't know what the population is now. A, a few hundred. So you could probably fit 10 people into a dinghy. Yeah. So that's like 140 people just took off. And it's like, and we land and we're told, and the place is so quiet. I'm like, the place is so quiet. And someone said, yeah, 14 dinghies on a convoy went to the Central Islands. Yeah, so it's that. And I'm like, ah, oh, of course. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things I get, you know, I guess an anthropologist will tell you that. You've got to just go and sit there and, isn't that right, Lottie? You've just got to go and sit there and sit there for a while and wait and see what happens. So, yeah, hopefully uh, uh, when I talk about measles, people might also want to talk about COVID and what, and what happened with COVID. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. You've been a delightful audience. <laughs>
all night listening to you talk. <laughs> um, I just want to um, add that next month for November, we're going to have First Nations man Nathan Sentence at Museum of Sydney, and you can register for that now online at sydneylivingmuseums.com. Thank you. Thanks again, Leah.